we sat in the waiting room. Not the outer waiting room where our ride sat, the inner one with dim lighting and the thermostat turned up because we were already in our hospital gowns. We sat there quietly. There was nothing to say. I mean, we all knew why we were there. The memory is blurry because I shelled out the extra $75 for morphine. The nurse said it would help with the pain and had the added bonus of erasing some of the memory of it all. One younger woman by the door to my right had paid for the morphine too, but it was too strong for her. Sit up, we urged her. Wake up, keep talking. It was too late. A nurse came in and saw that she was almost passed out. Come with me, honey. They helped her out. Couldn't give her an abortion when she was wasted. The rest of us contemplated what it would be like to go back home, still pregnant, still not wanting to be pregnant. I'm married, said a woman to my left, though no one had asked. We have a boy and we just bought a house. I have a good job. I just can't. My husband doesn't know I'm here. I'm married too, I said, trying to show solidarity. But everyone in my family knows I'm here, I thought. And for the first time in about a month, I felt lucky. I wasn't being entirely truthful, though, about the married part. I was already trying to control my wedding narrative, revisionist history, before any of it was history. The truth was that I had started the process of getting married in Shanghai, China, and I would finish the process once I flew back after my abortion. So technically, I was halfway married. Technically, I could still choose to not get married, to leave abandoned paperwork on a Chinese bureaucrat's desk. Four weeks earlier, on Valentine's Day, 1995, just before my 25th birthday, I went to the English language hospital to see why my period was late. It was the reason that periods are late. <laughs> I immediately scheduled an abortion for the next day. I was crying too hard to ride my bike back to my apartment, so I pushed it across Shanghai, sobbing. In these pre-cell phone days, I had to wait until I got home to call my boyfriend to tell him. He came right over with a dozen roses and proposed to me as soon as I opened my apartment door. Red roses on Valentine's Day make the proposal sound romantic, but we had only been dating a little more than two months. Sure, he and I had fun dancing at the club on weekends, getting dim sum with friends, biking to the Korean restaurant for dinner, but we hardly knew each other. Deciding to get married at this point in our relationship was the territory of after-school television specials. I knew better. I'd seen people trapped in such marriages in my hometown, even in my extended family. This was not how my story was supposed to go. I was the independent one who flew across the world to teach English at a Chinese university. I was the one who traveled alone through China and Southeast Asia on holidays. I was the one who had left convention back home in South Carolina. So why did I say yes? Hormones? Shock? Did I want everything to magically work out? Was I scared no one else would ever want to marry me? Yes. The next morning, we canceled the abortion appointment, and two days later, on my 25th birthday, we called my parents to tell them, first, that we were getting married, and then, that I was pregnant. You know, the phone call all parents love to get <laughs> from their daughters on the other side of the planet. <laughs> For about a week, we were happily engaged and expecting. Plain house. He biked over from his folks' apartment with some clothes, holding his VCR under his arm, and just like that, we'd moved in together. <laughs> we cooked dinners with the produce we bought in the street market. We were still having fun. This could work, I tried to convince myself. Then we found out there were medical complications. 
A medicine I'd taken had a high likelihood of causing a miscarriage. I have a rare blood type, so if I miscarried, it would render me unable to have live births in the future. Another phone call with my parents, who had my childhood doctor, also my father's first cousin, on the line, confirmed the problem. Dr. Jimmy thought the choice was pretty clear. Have an abortion now and keep the possibility of future children. Don't have the abortion and most likely lose both this pregnancy as well as all future ones. It didn't feel like an easy choice, though. And no matter how much of an independent spirit I'd like to believe I was, this is not how I wanted things to go down. Marriage proposals were to be very separate from pregnancy tests. Parents could meet boyfriends, whether they approved of them or not, um, quite separate from wedding announcements, which in turn were to be separate from announcements that their first grandchild was expected and conversations about the viability of pregnancies and the possibility of future pregnancies should not be on the phone with your doctor with your parents on the line. Mm -hmm. There was apparently a limit to the amount of social norms I could buck, and that bothered me. Decades into the one-child policy, doctors in China were, of course, very adept at providing abortions. However, I had to fly home for the procedure because the shot I needed to prevent my body from developing the problematic antibodies wasn't available there. My boyfriend, my fiance, couldn't come with me because he didn't have a visa yet. So back across the Pacific I flew, crying most of the 27 hour flight. I was crying because I was emotionally exhausted from the weight of the decisions because no matter how far away I had gone from home, I had still fallen into the same old knocked up, getting married trap. No matter how I looked at it, I felt like a failure. I mean, you're not supposed to come back home with something your mama has to cure or raise. My sense of self, my faith in my own judgment was shaken to the core. A couple days after the abortion, my cousin doctor asked me if I was still going to marry my boyfriend now that there was no pregnancy. Here was the chance for me to come clean, to acknowledge that I was 25, teaching English in China, and just having a fling. The fling resulted in an unplanned pregnancy that didn't work out. This was my chance to admit that my fiancé proposed only because I was pregnant, and I said yes only because I was pregnant. I couldn't do it. I couldn't admit that to my cousin doctor or to myself. In China, one of the driving concepts in society is that of saving face. Interactions have to be managed so that no one is publicly shamed. I was too proud to admit that I had made a mistake and the only way, even now, that I can explain how I spent the rest of my time in South Carolina before flying back to Shanghai was that I was on a mission to save face. I started crafting my own narrative about how it all went down. Cross-cultural romance. We knew we were meant to be together. Completely out of the story was any mention of the pregnancy or the abortion or how briefly we had known each other. No, you can take the girl out of the South, but you can't take the South out of the girl for me. Then the next step was burying my doubts in material possessions. Registering. Denial and consumerism. A very intoxicating brew. I threw myself into this process in an almost maniacal way. My sorority president, homecoming queen mom, was only too happy to assist me because, for one, it involved fewer tears, and her discomfort at my crying was reaching a breaking point. It was also some common ground for the two of us, which was comforting, creating a sense of normalcy. China, crystal, silver, stainless steel. For the past two years in Shanghai, I'd eaten off plates I'd bought for 50 cents at the corner shop. Now I was developing strong opinions on both formal and everyday China patterns. 
Next stop, engraved wedding announcements. How many to order? Hundreds. And thank you notes engraved with my initials. When the shop clerk asked what initials were going on the card, I said, my own. No name change for me, though it wasn't even an issue since women don't change their names in China. Ironically, if changing my name had somehow been an absolute requirement, that might have been enough to slow me down and make me think about what I was doing. But it wasn't, and I didn't. I flew back to Shanghai with the marriage machine fully in motion on both sides of the Pacific. I am getting married, damn it! And I did. 20 years later, and I can forgive myself for saying yes when he first proposed, and I have no regrets at all about the abortion. But I still can't forgive myself for not snapping out of it in the six weeks between the proposal and completing the paperwork in Shanghai. It haunts me. I know how far I will go, how much I will endure, all because I couldn't admit that I had made a mistake. That was Marion Wilson.